This is lecture 10, non-obviousness 3. So this lecture has three components. We're going to talk about the person having ordinary skill in the art, how that person is defined, um, where the controversies usually lie, and talk some about the strategy involved in litigation in terms of setting um, this hypothetical person having ordinary skill in the art. And then we're going to talk about the scope and the content of the prior art. This is a major area of disputes in obviousness cases um, and defining what the, co what the scope of the prior art is, what art is available to use in the obviousness analysis, uh, as well as what it contains um, are, are critical aspects to understanding obviousness. And then finally we're going to talk about secondary considerations, which we mentioned uh, earlier in the course, but also um, said that we would talk in more detail about them and how they have emerged as a critically important part of the non-obviousness analysis in the modern era. So let's dive right in to the person having ordinary skill in the art. This is pretty much where we ended last class with respect to uh, discussing how in the post-KSR world the person having ordinary skill in the art seems reinvigorated. The person having ordinary skill in the art is, a, uh, is now a creative person, uh, has common sense, uh, can fill in a lot more gaps in the um, the prior art that's available and so forth. Um, so I think that, you know, as I said in the last class, this is going to be a new area, a new battleground in terms of litigation is disputes uh, about what we mean by a person having ordinary skill in the art. The, the case I wanted you to read for this is Daiichi Sanko. Um, and this is a sort of classic example of a dispute over the level of ordinary skill in the art. Um, so the, the issue here is a method for treating bacterial ear infections by topically administering an antibiotic. Right? So uh, what the district court decided was that a, a person of ordinary skill in the art would have a medical degree, this can be found on page 363 by the way, a medical degree, experience treating patients with ear infections, and knowledge of the pharmacology and use of antibiotics, would be a pediatrician or general practitioner those doctors who are often the first line of defense in treating ear infections um, and who possess basic pharmacological knowledge. Right? That's disputed. Right? So Apotex, the, the patent defendant here, the defendant in the uh, patent suit, wants a different level of skill in the art. What they want is a higher level of skill in the art. Right? Apotex argues that the district court erred and that one having ordinary skill in the relevant art is defined as a person engaged in developing new pharmaceuticals, formulations, and treatment methods, or a specialist in ear treatment such as an ontologist, otolaryngologist, or an, I don't know how to pronounce that last one, who also has training in pharmaceutical formulations, right? The idea here is that what Apotex wants is a more specialized, probably higher relative skill, um, uh, area of uh, a person having ordinary skill in the art. So how does that affect the case, right? I mean, the, what's the strategy that Apotex wants here? They obviously want a higher level of skill. Well, if the skill level is higher, then that means the person having ordinary skill in the art is more likely to find things obvious, right? Because if you're higher relative skill, you're going to understand more about the prior art. You're going to be able to fill in more gaps. You'll have more training from which you can uh, draw from uh, in terms of uh, finding things obvious. And so that's why Apotex, the de patent defendant here, they want the most skillful um, uh, person having ordinary skill in the art that they can come up with. That's the idea. So. The, the interesting issue here is there's an interplay, right? Because you'll remember that we also use the person of ordinary skill in the art. We also use this analysis for section 112, right? So conversely, if you have a skillful person having ordinary skill in the art for 112 purposes, right? That means you don't need as much enablement. Right, that that by you know exactly the same analysis follows. A more skillful person of art uh, of ordinary skill in the art will be able to fill in more gaps. They'll be more educated. They'll know more, and therefore the amount of disclosure that will be required to teach them how to enable the invention will be less. Right. So in some ways, what Apotex has to decide here is: Are we going to attack this patent on 103 grounds? Go for high level of skill. 
They could also choose an alternative route and they could say we're going to attack this patent on enablement grounds, try and argue for a lower level of skill and not worry so much about obviousness but worry more, um, push their chips more on the, on the enablement requirement. Right? So the, the person of ordinary skill in the art is the same uh, for each inquiry per patent. Right? But note that, that depending on the level of skill that will change the analysis. Uh, for each of these sections. Right? Another thing I want to point your attention to on, on uh, the Daiichi Sanko case is on uh, page 363 about two-thirds down. What the district court apparently did in this case is they, uh, as the district court uh, searched through federal circuit opinions dealing with similar technologies, same kinds of technologies, found one where there was a finding of a level of skill in the art for a similar kind of technology and adopted that as the level of skill in the art for this case. And the Federal Circuit's very clear in saying that is impermissible. Right? And what is meant here, the holding here, is that the person having ordinary skill in the art is a new person for every patent. Right? It varies by patent. And so in order to determine that, the court um, goes through at the bottom of page 363 and the top of page 364 um, the, the analysis. And the analysis is multifaceted. Uh, you take a look at the, the invention, what kinds of, of um, things was, uh, were, were being analyzed at the time. Uh, although inventors are not persons of ordinary skill in the art, they may be in fact much greater uh, than ordinary skill in the art. It's still relevant as part of the multi-factor analysis uh, to consider. And here, um, uh, Inventor Sato is a university professor. Uh, Inventor Honda was a clinical development part department manager where the, he was involved with new drug development and clinical trials. And Inventor Katahara was a research scientist in Daiichi engaged in research and development of antibiotics. That's relevant, although it doesn't conclude um, and it's not dispositive, it's relevant to the consideration of who a person of ordinary skill in the art would be. Right? Others working in the same field, you'll see that um, the, uh, the court then looked and saw what other people uh, in the field uh, who did this type of, of work look like and, and, fought, and, uh, and looked accordingly and then an, an analysis of what kind of problem was trying to be solved and the court decides this is really not a general practitioner or pediatrician problem. Right? The claim was directed to the development of a new drug and therefore the person of skill in the art is somebody who would be skilled and experienced in that higher level of skill therefore more likely to find uh, obviousness and the district court erred in that respect. Right? So that's a good, I think it's a good case, it's a nice example of the way um, that persons of ordinary skill in the art can analyze multi-factor analysis, what types of problems are being solved, what's the area of technology, what do people look like, who, or, you know, what kind of educational level do people have, and what are their backgrounds who do similar types of work, uh, and you go from there. This is a fact question. Uh, it can be, it's often decided by the judge, but it can in some cases be sent to the jury if, if the parties so request. Right? So that's how to determine the person of ordinary skill in the art. Let's talk about what we mean by the scope and content of the prior art. Right? This is our, our second uh, uh, gram factor that we've uh, discussed. Right? What is the scope and content of the prior art? Well, the quick answer here is that section 102 defines what prior art is. Right? So if you have prior art that fits into the various sections, and I've listed them here on the slide, right, um, of 102, then that is prior art for purposes of 103. Right? And again, until, until March 16th, uh, 2013, uh, all patents filed by then, that will be uh, under the old law, which will have um, invention date as a key date for 102A. Um, after that date, those patents that are filed after that date will have effective filing date as the key date. So that'll change, you know, the parameters of prior art. But what's not going to change is the fact that you use 102 as sort of a gatekeeper for determining what kinds of prior art can be used um, in your obviousness analysis. Right. So you can almost think of it this way: it, it is that the 102 um, tells you what kinds of art you can put on your on your desk for analysis. You know, if you're thinking about this in terms of I've got to 
compile a bunch of prior art that I can use for my analysis, 102 tells you what goes on the desk, right? And then more importantly, what goes off the desk. 103 then tells you how to how it can be fit together, um, uh, whether or not that that art actually um, uh, invalidates the patent. But 102 is your gatekeeper from a prior art uh, perspective, right? But even though uh, art uh, is prior art under section 102, it is not necessarily good art for purposes of 103. That's because the Federal Circuit, um, which appears to have been at least somewhat endorsed uh, by uh, KSR, uh, the Supreme Court in KSR, has adopted what it describes as the analogous art requirement. Okay? The analogous art requirement is fairly straightforward. All art, the only art that's available uh, in terms of good prior art for 103 is that which is pertinent to the field of the invention or pertinent type to the types of problems to be solved. All right? So it's either in the, in the relevant fields, related fields, that's, that can generally be sort of described fairly broadly, relevant or related fields, or relevant or related to the types of inventions to be solved. So why do you think the Federal Circuit has imposed this? Well, I think it goes back to the concern about hindsight with respect to 103, right? So again, imagine that, that you could, because in 103 you can combine references. If you sort of had the ability to just pull references off library shelves and just put them together irrespective of whether they had you know any relationship, you could almost certainly find each element of an invention somewhere in the prior art. Again, the idea here is that most um, pieces of, uh, most inventions are combinations of, of old things put together in new and different ways. Um, and so given enough time, enough ability to combine, there's really no limit to the ways that you could combine uh, prior art in order to invalidate a patent under 103. So because that's sort of classic hindsight uh, concern, uh, the Federal Circuit has, has said no, you can only um, use prior art that's analogous. Now, they, they draw that pretty broadly, right? It doesn't have to be exactly the same field as the invention. It can be closely related fields are fine. Um, uh, so it, it's, not, it's not too strict, but it is a requirement. It's a requirement that you can't just choose any old uh, piece of art. Why don't we have an analogous art requirement for 102 is an interesting question, right? Um, because if, if our concern is that people are going to sort of randomly pick here and there, try and find um, the, uh, the, the relevant art, why not do the same? Why not have that limitation for 103, or sorry, for 102 as well? And we don't. Uh, 102, there is no limit uh, if you, for novelty purposes. Uh, as long as you find all of the elements in one reference, uh, it's going to be uh, invalidating under 102. And so I'll leave it for you to think about why we might not have an analogous art requirement in 102 uh, when we do in 103, right? So the scope of the prior art is, is basically a three-part process here, right? Section 102 defines all of the available prior art, right? If it meets the, the, the tests of Section 102 in terms of being good prior art, um, then it is prior art for purposes of 103. Uh, there's a limit though. Some art will not be available because it's not analogous. It's not analogous prior art. If it's not analogous prior art, then it's not available. Um, and we discussed an al analogous art a minute ago. The other thing that's important to understand is that all analogous art, that's uh, 102 art, is attributed to the knowledge of the person having ordinary skill in the art. All right? The, the classic case on this that the Federal Circuit did is called In Ray Winslow, where the court sort of um, describes the inventor, uh, the person having ordinary skill in the art, you know, working in his or her workshop. Um, and the court says, we imagine that, that all relevant prior art is assembled on the walls around this person. And, uh, and therefore, there's you know, good knowledge of everything that's prior art. It's all attributed to the, um, to the person having ordinary skill in the art, right? So as you can obviously tell, a person having ordinary skill in the art is really not ordinary in that sense. I mean, there aren't probably many people who know every single bit of prior art in their entire field at any given moment. 
Um, but that's how it works, right? The idea is that the scope and content of the prior art is everything. It is everything that is analogous and fits 102, right? So a pretty broad sweep for 103 in terms of scope and content of the prior art. Now again, remember back um, to KSR, um, there's a dispute uh, after KSR in terms of how easily you can combine references. Um, the, the Supreme Court in KSR are, uh, suggests that the teaching suggestion motivation test is, is uh, when applied rigidly is no good. Uh, on the other hand, they say it can be a useful analysis. So it might not be that you can always combine these references in every case, um, but it is certainly true that the, the law that all analogous uh, 102 art is attributable to the person having ordinary skill uh, is still good law, right? I mean, again, this is the basic problem, uh, the policy problem that we've been trying to deal with with Section 103 all along, which is, you know, Section 103 allows references to be combined. All prior art related to the field or to the problems to be solved is included in the analysis, but we know if we're standing on shoulders of giants, is there anything likely to be truly non-obvious, right? I mean, the, the concern here is that because we're sweeping so broadly for art, we're allowing lots of combinations of, uh, of the art in order to uh, find each element of the claim, then are we not simply um, uh, disallowing all kinds of innovations because of our hindsight bias, because it's so difficult for us as human beings to cast our mind back uh, to those earlier uh, times to determine whether or not this invention was obvious or not obvious at the time of invention or time of uh, effective filing date, uh, depending on, on the issue. So, you know, one of the things that I think is going to be a struggle going forward in the post-KSR world at the Federal Circuit is to try and deal with the analogous art requirement um, which the, the which KSR seems to have broadened um, somewhat, uh, even more than what the Federal Circuit was doing, um, and and understand, you know, how what are the limits of this, right? Are, are we going to enter a, an era now where there's uh, lots of rejections of of inventions under 103 because it's so uh, easy to combine references and you can find references even far afield from the the relevant art. Or are, is the Federal Circuit going to come up with an articulation that's not formalistic and rigid in the way that the um, uh, Supreme Court disapproved of in KSR and, and yet um, provide some sense of structure uh, and limit to combat the hindsight problem? So let's, let's finish up um, with some uh, discussion of secondary considerations. We really haven't discussed these at all, right? So up to now, we've been discussing the basic elements of obviousness, right? The basic elephant elements of obviousness are to determine the differences between the invention and the prior art, to determine the level of skill in the relevant art, and third, to determine the scope and content of the prior art. Right? And from there, you move on to the question of whether or not it's obvious. Okay? Um, so obvious, uh, so that's the, the way that that works. Um, uh, and then the court in Graham goes on to say that it is a secondary consideration. Uh, could be relevant, secondary considerations, right? So Graham calls these secondary considerations. The Federal Circuit has upgraded them to some degree by calling them objective indicia of non-obviousness, right? What they are is sort of an add-on, right? They're an additional um, uh, analysis that can be done um, to try and, and get at the question of whether or not a particular invention is uh, good prior art or, or, sorry, not good prior art, is good uh, under 103 or not good under 103. Right? And in fact, the Federal Circuit has upgraded this so much um, that it has said in the Strataflex case that it would be jurisprudentially inappropriate to exclude considerations of secondary um, uh, objectives, secondary indicia. Right? So uh, district courts are on notice, essentially, from the Federal Circuit that they need to consider these secondary considerations. They need to consider them. Don't need, they aren't necessarily dispositive, and indeed, as we'll see in a moment, they're almost never actually dispositive, but they do have uh, an important role to play. So here's the basic list of secondary considerations. You probably saw them in the book um, uh, listed out as well. Um, commercial success, 
long felt need or the failure of others, evidence of copying, skepticism prior to the invention or praise after the invention, or licensing or acquiescence to the patent. All right? So one of the things to think about is how relevant each one of these actually are um, to uh, the overall obviousness analysis. And that's part of what the iron grip barbell case uh, is all about, right? So the invention in iron grip barbell um, is basically, here's the claim, a weight plate for physical fitness including a plate body, said body further formed with solely a triad of spaced apart elongated handle openings, right? So you can sort of see this. Uh, the elongated handle openings in a in a triad formula, meaning three of them and arranged in that way. Um, said plate defining a triad of integral handle elements for grasping. Right? Turns out the prior art, the, the relevant patent is at the top there, the prior art is at the bottom. The prior art had four openings, elongated handle-like openings, and two openings. Right? So one of the big challenges that Iron Grip Barbell has right off the bat is uh, trying to uh, argue that this is a non-obvious invention in light of the prior art, right? Uh, the argument, the basic argument is simply switching handles from the numbers two to three or four down to three is one, uh, is a change that a person of ordinary skill in the art would easily understand and find obvious, right? And so what, what the inventor here has to rely on or tries to rely on is secondary considerations, right? So what they say is, all right, so it might be that persons having ordinary skill in the art would understand the change from four to three or two to three um, as being obvious, but when you consider the secondary considerations that I have, I, you know, my invention is, uh, is non-obvious, right? And what are the secondary considerations? Well, Iron Grip Barbell primarily focuses uh, in this case on commercial success, right? So what they argue is that this has been a, a commercially successful product and therefore it must be non-obvious because if it was such a obvious invention, trivial invention, then it would be um, uh, not particularly successful on the market. Um, they also note that prior to them getting the patent, um, and, and still apparently, relatively few manufacturers of uh, uh, barbells, uh, barbell weight plates have uh, three handles. Um, there's a number of other options out there, but three handles are relatively rare. And of those that are doing three handles, most of the manufacturers of those three-handled plates are um, licensing the patent. Right. The court finds uh, this not to be good evidence of uh, commercial success, and, and the question is why? Well, the issue here is that there's no nexus between the invention, here being the, th the, um, the plate with the three openings arranged like handles, and the rest of, uh, and the commercial success. Right? And that's important to understand, which is that the court says you need, in order to show a commercial success as a secondary consideration, you need to show that there's a feature of the claimed invention, right? that it's the claimed invention that's causing some sort of success. Right? You can't just say generally that you have good success because there's lots of other reasons people could be successful with their products that don't have anything to do with the technical merit of the invention. And what obviousness is about is about technical merit. Now the secondary considerations push that envelope a little bit by considering some of these non-technical things. But what the Federal Circuit says um, repeatedly is that you have to show that it's the technical aspects, the technical merit um, as part of your secondary considerations that are uh, driving uh, whatever these secondary considerations are. Right? So that's why when you line these up and you sort of think about uh, the different kinds of, uh, of commercial, success, you know, secondary considerations. I think different ones have, have different uh, impact and indeed some are easier than others to show that they can connect um, to the claimed invention itself, right? So for example, commercial success is quite difficult, right, to show a nexus because it's not enough as the court makes clear in Iron Grip Barbell to simply show success in the marketplace. You have to show um, something quite specific about the features of the invention and that's pretty difficult to do. 
showing that it's the features of the claimed invention itself that's causing uh, or driving that commercial success. Um, the trend at the Federal Circuit has been to tighten up this nexus requirement uh, over time uh, because of concerns that, that they were getting away from uh, the uh, technical merit analysis of Section 103 and more into a marketplace analysis. So um, it is, it's pretty strict now and, and it's pretty rare that you can find uh, commercial success being a, a strong factor in favor uh, of a patent claim on, under 103. A long felt need or a failure of others is, um, uh, on the other hand, pretty important. Right? Uh, the courts generally see this as a, a quite important factor. Right? And what we mean by this, right, and when we say long felt need, is that there's been you know, a problem that hasn't been solved. Right? That for a long time there's been a particular kind of problem out there that maybe many people have tried or commented on or, or there's been a, a need in the marketplace, a need in sort of the innovation space that has never really been filled and this invention fills it. Right? Even more relevant is if you can show evidence that other people have been trying for a long time to fill this need. Right to solve the problem, to fill the commercial niche, whatever it is, and they fail. Now again, you need to show nexus. You need to show that the issue here is uh, related to your patent claims and not just sort of generally your product. Right, but if you can show this, the courts have found this to be very persuasive. Right, the idea here, the theory, right, is that if lots of people are looking for solutions to a problem, and you come up with one. You know, if they've looked for a long time, lots of people have done it, there's been real money behind it, you come up with a solution, that then seems like it's proof of the technical merit of your innovation and therefore more likely to be a non-obvious invention than not. So that's why long felt need and failure of others is particularly pertinent in this uh, context. Right? Um, where do you find this? Well, it's a little difficult to know. You might find, um, you know, you might demonstrate uh, by bringing in a bunch of research uh, in the field showing that people were trying to solve this problem. Uh, you might bring in trade articles or magazines that would say, oh, I wish that somebody, you know, saying things like, we wish that somebody had solved this problem. In the Iron Grip Barbell case, there really wasn't any long felt need. It didn't seem like the market was crying out for um, three-handled barbells. It seemed like the fours and the twos and indeed the sixes and the sevens and the eights were serving the market just fine. Uh, there was no big uh, clamor for three-gripped, uh, triad-gripped uh, barbells uh, in any event. So um, uh, that's the long felt need uh, analysis and that is probably of all of them uh, the most uh, relevant, right? Copying, right? So, so sometimes the courts will say uh, and analyze uh, that if lots of the industry has copied your innovation that that might somehow be evidence of um, commercial success. Uh, the answer to this is copying is rarely a particularly powerful argument in part because there's lots and lots of reasons that people might copy your innovation uh, which don't have a lot to do with the technical merit of your invention. Uh, it might be, for example, that they think your patent is invalid and so it's easier to copy than to make their own. It might be that what you've done is make something cheaper and unless your claims are directed to cheaper, uh, then it's uh, unlikely that that's part of the technical merit of your innovation. So that's you know why copying is generally not a very strong factor, although you do see it argued from time to time. Skepticism before the invention or praise after the invention can be quite relevant, right? Can be quite relevant. Uh, you know, you win awards for you know the best innovation of the year. Uh, that's evidence of technical merit uh, and potential non-obviousness. Now, again, the key showing here is going to be the nexus uh, to your claimed invention, right? Because there's a lot of reasons that you might be praised or that people might be skeptical of your innovations beforehand. Um, but that said, if you can show uh, that there was technical skepticism and technical praise, um, then that's that's very good. So, you know, going back to the Adams case, right? The the wet uh, the wet lead acid 
uh, battery case. There you had very good evidence of people being extremely skeptical of his innovation, of, of the fact that this would work. In fact, there was lots of prior art that specifically said that this type of method was um, not only not going to work, but was probably explosive. Um, and, and then afterwards, you saw praise where people were saying, wow, it really does work. And, and lots of adoption of the invention. So uh, because of that, the, that can be quite powerful, again, as long as it's technical in nature and not generally um, uh, uh, praise for your marketing or, or the color of your product or whatever, right? So licensing and acquiescence, um, you know, the argument here is if lots of people are licensing your patent, uh, that must mean it's non-obvious. And I think that most people think that this is not a particularly relevant criteria because obviously um, licensing decisions encompass much more than pure technical merit. Uh, it might be that you're offering licensing rates at a very low fee. Uh, it might that, uh, be that they don't want to uh, fight in patent litigation. Uh, there could be other reasons to, to license a patent even if it's not technically uh, particularly strong. And, and so that's um, usually a pretty weak factor, um, uh, but it does come up from time to time. So that's secondary considerations, right? So that's the, um, uh, and the big ones are, you know, commercial success is probably argued most often. Long felt need and failure of others is probably the most powerful in terms of your ability to overcome what would otherwise be a case for obviousness. Um, copying is not particularly good uh, typically. Skepticism is often good, but it has to be technical. Uh, skepticism prior and praise after. Make sure these are technical in nature. And licensing and acquiescence is rarely uh, particularly relevant um, for uh, the analysis. Right? So that is um, obviousness. And that's it for lecture 10, non-obviousness 3. And I will see you next time.